3,000. What is doing? My name's Maloney. This is the 3,000 Podcast. Today, I'm joined by an anti-advertising activist, <laughs> Kyle McGee. Kyle, thanks for coming. No problem, Maloney. Thanks for having me. Is that what you want to be known as? Are you an activist? Are you a, a person? What do you want to be? Yeah, well, I am a person. I mean, <laughs> people do say the word activist and, yeah, anti-advertising is obviously, yeah, the thing. So, yeah, that's that That will be the title. There's not really much you can do about it, is there? No, people will place labels on you whether you like them or not, really. Yeah. So I guess that's the one that they've placed on you. Um, before we jump in and talk about your history, do you want to tell people a, a brief outline of, like, the demotic, de, dem, <laughs> I can't even say it, democratic media please mentality? Yeah, all the mentality. Yeah, I guess that's me. Um, all right. Well, where do I start? Basically, I became aware of, you know, colonialism, the history of the world, modern day, late stage capitalism, and was kind of horrified and um, had a bit of a breakdown. I was studying science and engineering at the time. Um, and yeah, took a gap year, went traveling to try and think about what I could possibly do. And yeah, it was during that year that I first just had the idea that you can't have democracy with a media system that is funded and run by corporates. You know, we live in a corpocracy. That's the biggest problem with these democracies that people have fought for over hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. They just don't work. They serve the interests of the rich. And we can't allow the media to be controlled by these people. Like, pretty pretty simple. It's not a complicated stance. It sounds complicated, but when you break it down to the crux of it, it's pretty simple. Yeah. Yeah, democratic media is for people. It serves people's interests. It talks about things that are relevant to people. But what we've got is this system of obfuscation and lies, which is basically just to continue the profit-driven machine, which mm -hmm. is destroying the planet, destroying lives. And, you know, we live in a state of constant warfare to keep this many-tiered system of exploitation. It's got to stop. Mm -hmm. Yep, and you're actually doing something about it. I think a lot of people have this mindset and they think, well, what can I do? So you're actually doing something about it. You're getting off your ass and you're making it happen. Yeah, but it wasn't like I chose to do it. I couldn't not do it, you know, like I was freaking out. I was losing my mind. I was going to die basically if I didn't do something on this. And, okay. You know, yeah, basically saved my life. Like I was so depressed about all this stuff. And, you know, you go to other people and you talk about it and everyone's sort of like, yeah, we know, we know, we know, but what can you do? What can you do? Mm. Yeah, so I had to find something and I did, which yep. is uh, pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. So let's break it down for your personal journey. So you finish school, you're just thinking you're going to be a part of the system. You're thinking I'm going to go and study, you go to university. What are you studying there? Um, yeah, I was studying science and engineering for no real reason. Because um, that's what you do after school. Yeah, yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, I did high school in Shepparton and um, yeah, I just maths and science was what came easiest to me so I did that and then I got a certain score and was like oh I can go to a uni what can I do you know with these subjects there was no thought behind it mm -hmm. and I'd look at other people who had sort of passion for what they were doing and the thought geez that'd be great but yeah I didn't really realize what my passion would be and just how much it would control my life <laughs> yeah so the early years of uni or the early year that you were at uni that it became evident pretty quickly that that sort of path wasn't for you uh, not really. I just wasn't really that interested in it. I mean, yeah, like I was studying electrical engineering and I guess, you know, you start thinking about what you're going to do. You're going to work for a multinational corporation who makes these products out of rare earths mined by children in Africa and, you know, they're designed to be obsolete. They're actually, you know, technologies that are destroying people's attention, sort of all of that stuff. I'm just like, what is the point of this, you know? Yeah, like maybe I'll get a job where I have some money, but, like, is this creating... A, a better world is this a good thing mm -hmm. and um the answer was no no and then so you decide to take a year like a gap year type scenario travel around where'd you head to um i went to ireland because you know that was my heritage i was on a bit of a what the fuck am i doing in australia sort of trip yep. um and yeah I, I went through north america on the way there stayed there for a bit went through um europe after I left, I worked in Ireland in a sporting warehouse for a bit, went quickly through Europe, 
went to Southeast Asia, India, Sri Lanka. Jeez, that's a lot in a year, man. Yeah, well, it was like a round the world oh, ticket yeah. as you as you did at the time. But yeah, I was in Sri Lanka when the Boxing Day tsunami happened, and that was kind of a, a big moment for me, just because you know you you live you live seeing these countries that are sort of in really bad shape because of what colonialism has done to them over hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. And yet then a natural disaster happens and everybody's very generous and wants to solve this problem. I was just like, humans are the biggest natural disaster that's ever happened to humans. Like this place was fucked before this wave came and it was all because of what our developed countries do to the rest of the world. Yeah, and I'm guessing that's a bit of an eye-opening thing because before that you only see these things from afar on TV, you know, that sort of thing. And then when you're there, you're like, well, hang on a second, this is, this is in your face and it's real. Yeah, I mean, yes and no. Like, I don't know, maybe I've got a good imagination. But, yeah, I was travelling that year and going, well, now I can tell people that I've travelled. But it didn't really change things for me that much. <laughs> like reading and, and, and looking and, and imagining what it's like in these places is almost enough a lot of the time. Yeah. But, yeah, the lived experience is something that people really uh, bang on about, isn't it? Yeah, well, that's it. So then you come back and then you think, I'm going to start uni or this is when you thought... Back at uni or you thought, no, nah, there's something, there's something, a different path for me. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, I did have the idea of the um, painting over billboards and saying the whole corporate media is a load of shit that needs to end. But, yeah, I basically, I guess I, I went, okay, maybe that, that's pretty extreme. Look, look, I'll just try to go back to the course. Obviously, I would know how everyone would react if I did that. So, yeah, I tried to go back and um, continue the course, but I just couldn't. So you felt it wasn't right. You didn't sit right with you. Yeah, yeah, no. I just physically, emotionally, just couldn't do it. I was like, I can't live this way. And yeah. so yeah, I dropped out and painted over billboards, and then <laughs> you know started <laughs> getting taken by the police to the psychiatric ward of the hospital to make sure I was fit to interview. Wow. That sort of stuff. And okay. So yeah, then it was a whole journey of me trying to prove that I'm not insane to a system that will always say you're insane if you're against it. Yeah. So, yeah. That's yeah, man. I, I think it's true, but it's it's it's, a, it's daunting when you put it into those words. Yeah, it's like so with with your journey of doing that. Do you remember the first billboard that you did, or the first thinking, all right, I'm going to actually go and, and do this because it's a it's one. It's people have these ideas that this stuff's fucked, but to go get your paint, get your roll up, put it into practice is a different scenario. Yeah, um, there was a billboard just around the corner of my house, which was where I started. I was in. East Brunswick, no, Brunswick West at the time. And, yeah, I just picked targets that were easy and um, went for them. Had a white ute at the time, Looks dressed up like a worker, painted them neatly from one side to the other. Nobody said anything. And, um, yeah, before I got caught by the police, I, I ended up stopping painting just because people were asking me why I was doing it and I sort of realised that I wasn't very good at explaining it. I couldn't make people understand. So there was kind of like no point doing it if I couldn't really explain yeah. exactly what it was about. Maybe because I was, you know, science and engineering background, maybe, um, you know, words weren't my forte. So, um, yeah, sort of like I was working at a rubber factory and writing every night trying to like, you know, work, work out how to explain this to people. And that's where that... The PDF came from that that sort of breaks down why the fuck are you doing this? Oh no, that was years later. later. But yeah, yeah. But that's I, the I guess that's the the first evolution of of trying to put words into something that is essentially just void and, and blankness. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, there's a lot behind that yeah. that blankness. Yeah, it stands for a lot. <laughs> it does. And so that you're picking billboards that you think. So let's just break it down for people. You believe that advertising can exist if you sign up for it but when it's in public spaces and people aren't about it or didn't ask for it then you think it's not cool yeah yeah well i mean the way that the internet is now there's no need for advertising if, you, if you're interested in a product or a service you can search for it like of course you're not going to stop a company from producing promotional material about their product or service but it shouldn't be people shouldn't get it unless they go there and directly ask for it yeah. And, yeah, sort of like if you had legislation that made that a legal thing, it would be, you know, there's no advertising in public media systems. There's no advertising in the street. It's just a, it's a thing that companies can produce but you have to seek out to, to get any of. So does that sort of ideal – is it anywhere in the world? Can, can, is there a country or a city where that exists? 
Oh, well, not to my knowledge. Yeah. So you think that it's well, it's a, it's an interesting one because I think I agree with you, but if not one country in the world has done it, has managed to do it, it's a fucking tall order. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, like, which country would do it in the whole world of integrated world capitalism? Like, it's it's a very dangerous proposition. Mm-hmm. Like, it it totally it takes away corporate's power. You know, it denies them a voice. But it's basically like. Our, we'll have human rights or corporates can continue to have all these rights that are much greater than ours and that ride over the top of us. It's a, it's a choice. It's mm. like do humans have rights or do corporations have rights? Yeah, well, we all think that humans should have <laughs> rights, but if you ask other people, they probably think their company is more important than, than Joe Blow on the street. Um, so now when you start painting billboards, like talking about specific ones, do you, do you – you start to get some attention, some eyeballs. People are asking you about it. Uh, people obviously aren't getting it, but some people are getting it. You feel like your message is getting across a little bit? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it takes some explaining, but, yeah, like th- even just the idea that we could have a media system that isn't completely bent towards corporate interests is just mind-blowing to people. But, you know, if you talk about the theory of democracy, it makes total sense that the media would be there to serve these democratic purposes. I say the word democracy a lot, don't I? <laughs> well, that's an interesting one. Like, so uh, we live in a democracy uh, technically here, but as you might say, we, we don't really. Mm. Um, what is your utopian view if you could redesign the political system or the way that we live? Would you be looking at communism or what, what is, what is, what kind, if you had to put a label on it, what are you thinking? Yeah, well, I stick with democracy because I think that it basically encompasses anything that people are down with, you know. Yeah. Like you could definitely have a, a system of socialism or communism, whatever you want to call it, with, with ideal democracy. I'd say that democracy that's working would always lead towards a system like that, a system where people aren't being exploited, a, people, a system where people's rights are, you know, taken seriously and respected. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it doesn't really matter to me. I'm just like... Democracy is the thing we need to improve to to go wherever that wherever it is that we are going to go. But if this if that's going to be the way that we're going to go, then the whole democratic system needs an overhaul, though. Like basically, need to break it down and start again. Well, yeah, not really. I mean, like, huh? <laughs> yeah, I mean, people have really lost faith in it to the point where most people on the left don't like don't even seem to care about improving democracy or making it work it's just like it's not going to work it's all fucked we need to like destroy the system and make something new but it's like well what is it what what's it going to be like if we can't have a system where we vote for people in in power if we we put people into power who are then like dependent on our approval to continue i don't understand how anything else could operate like outside of that like but we're into we've, we've found ourselves in this situation where people don't have faith in the current system but they believe dem- democracy is the right way to do it by by in large so yeah I, yeah do you know what i mean it's a, yeah it's a, it's, a, it's a bit of a we've found ourselves i think that the system has been in place for so long so people have lost faith in it but they realize that democracy is probably the best way to do it but we're just not we don't have faith in the current system yeah, or we're not like talking about the things that we need to change to get it happening. And, mm. you know, we can't <laughs> basically say it again. We can't have a corporate media. Our politicians are totally on the take. They're totally corrupt. Our media doesn't cover it. They're getting huge handouts all the time, these corporations. They, yeah, they distract. They, they talk over the top of really important stuff with really trivial crap. Like we, we can't be educated. We can't even sort of like our, our communal critical thinking is sort of fostered and established by the public discourse, you know, so we need that not to be controlled by the bad guys. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, like when I look back at the history of democracy or, you know, the escape from monarchy, absolute rulers, you know, know, that was considered impossible at one point when people are going, oh, maybe we shouldn't have a king who's just this despotic ruler who, like, kind of kills us all when he wants to. Mm -hmm. You know, that seemed impossible. But, you know, over time... The vote has been sort of expanded and it's got to this point where everybody has the vote, but it's meaningless because the whole political agenda is controlled by the corporates. It is a corpocracy. Yeah, so the two-party system needs to be abolished. Well, yeah, I mean, parties weren't even in the constitution. There's sort of like something that's just sort of popped up and started happening. I mean, really, you vote for people and they come together and they form government and they make decisions together. But, yeah, like the way that Australian politics is, yeah, you to even think about 
parliamentarians being mature adults who could sit down and have a conversation and make the right decision. Yeah. And they just yell over each other and shit. Yeah, yeah. It's just like it's sports, you know. There's one there's this team and there's that team and they yell at each other. Yeah. The end. It's it's yeah, it's kind of juvenile when you really break it down like that. Um so from your personal journey when you start painting over these billboards and then I'm guessing the because you mentioned the right and the left a little bit before. So are you getting respect and hate from both sides? Like who's – because it's an interesting thing that you're doing because the left obviously like the anti, like we're going to fuck the system up, but the right also don't want too much, you know, to be told what to do as well. So it's an interesting spot. Are you getting are you getting positive and negative vibes from both sides, did you feel like? Um, I don't think the right wing would appreciate what I'm doing in the slightest. Like they're, they're pretty happy with – um with power being to the rich people and, you know, the plebs keep on plebbing. Don't you think that the that, that right and left have kind of switched a little bit recently though? That kind yeah. Of thing? Like the, the old, you know what I mean? It has gone kind of skits. It's, it's pretty very, hard to yeah. even talk about things like that anymore, isn't it? It's crazy, but like even when you think about the sort of vaccine protests, I don't think I've ever seen in my lifetime or heard about something that the right and the left could kind of come, like you've got the alt-right people going, don't fucking tell us what to do, and you've got the left people going... We need to make our own decisions, and I've never seen the both of them come together like that in those sort of protests. Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting, interesting time. So I'm, it is. It, it was bizarre, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, I uh, luckily for me wasn't in Melbourne for most of the um, pandemic. So yeah. you know, don't hate me, Melbourne. I wasn't there. <laughs> yeah, you're one of the lucky ones. Mm. Um, so let's talk about who is embracing you. Like I'm guessing the graffiti sort of anti-establishment people are into it? Are they asking you questions or are they talking to you like you're making an artistic statement, not so much a political statement? Yeah, I mean, I think that the people who like it don't really need to ask questions, but, you know, whether they understand it in the same way that I do, I'm not really sure. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, like, I think everybody sort of immediately just is like, yeah, that's, you know, because we are, these images are pushed in our face all the time. We didn't get a choice. We don't want it. We don't appreciate it, you know. It, it diminishes people. It, it, you know, people have an emotional response to this constant like nagging and kind of it's you know it's a low level everyday abuse. So people sort of respond in an emotional way, like yeah, fucking sweet, like fuck those idiots up. They're so annoying. Yeah. But yeah, um, in terms of like it being a serious sort of political point about what the future of democracy, if there is a future of democracy, yeah, I, I'm, I mean. You tell me. Yeah. Well, look, yeah. No, I think I got shared your stuff from a graffiti friend and I was intrigued and that's when I reached out to you to, to see more. But I think that those people are pretty anti it, – it's a funny scenario. I think we spoke about this in text. Graffiti guys, most of them are anti-advertising sort of thing, but in turn graffiti is basically self-promotion advertising and putting yourself up there everywhere as well. Yeah, yeah. And then obviously like graffiti culture ends up in advertising a lot of the time and yeah, for for the for the writers and artists who are earning a lot of money, yeah, it's like it's wallpaper for capitalism, isn't yeah. it? It's um, you know, doing big walls for woolies or whatever. There's nothing they won't let a train or tram run that has graffiti on it, but then they can plaster advertising on it that you can't help but see. Yeah, like, yeah. Where's the fuck that that's just like hypocritic fucking gone crazy, you know? Definitely. Yeah. What about when you're when you're getting done or when you're doing some of the, the tram stops and that sort of thing, it's very peaceful the way that you do do your stuff and you just do it, you're polite, you're courteous as far as you can be, you know your rights, you know what you're doing wrong and what you're not doing wrong. How are the dealings with the, the met people uh, they can they they can't physically prevent you from doing that sort of stuff. The police can they like where you you obviously done your research and you know where you're at. Yeah, I mean I don't know like could they affect a citizen's arrest? Probably like look right. at the way that they hold down people and chase down people who don't have tickets and mm-hmm. like quite like terribly assault them while they're waiting for the police. Um, yeah, I guess they could do anything, but I just. Um, yeah, try to talk to them like people and hope that they won't do that. And, yeah, like it's a massive exercise of privilege on my part. You know, I'm a white, you know, 40-year-old man. Like I'm going to get the best treatment from these people and I'm sort of taking advantage of that. Yeah, yeah. So when you do just 
hit those tram stops, the ad shells or whatever they're fucking called, and do that, you know that eventually the cops are going to turn up and that's part of the process for yeah. you yeah. mentally when you go to do it. You're like, this is, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to achieve. And eventually the cops are going to turn up. Yeah, and I mean, they don't always. Like often, yeah, they just won't come. When I was postering, which is, you know, when I'd really minimise the sort of damage that I was causing... Yeah, often they just wouldn't show up. And it's not so much like that I want the interaction with the police or the contact with the court system. It's just that I want to make a public protest in, in public, you know, fully open. Yep. And as a consequence of that, this other stuff is going to happen. Yeah, and I guess that is one way that you can get some eyeballs on your eventual... The goal is to get people aware of what you're trying to... And so then you can get more people siding with you. Is that the event, eventual goal? Well, yeah, I guess so. I mean, when I started, it was all about me being happy with who I was and how I was living in the world. Like, I had to do this for me to feel okay. And then, yeah, I remember, like, being in jail going, like, I don't want, like, because, yeah, ego gets into everything. And I'm like, if I'm doing this to, to say that, you know, we need to improve democracy in this way... People might agree with me. They might like the stance that I've taken. Then I have some kind of social capital. Like I didn't want to be in that <laughs> egotistical world, which is just the world of humans. And I was like, okay, I'll just paint over billboards and I'll be in jail forever and no one will ever know and then I'll die and that'll be fine. But at least I know I didn't do it for ego. And you'll live with yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but, you know, obviously as I thought through that, I'm like, that's stupid. Like if you're doing this, it's because you want people to know what you're doing and you do want to influence things. But obviously I know what I'm trying to influence, you know, the power that it has yeah. that's always going to be arrayed against me. So it's like, yeah, like I'll achieve what I achieve, which is probably not much, but, yeah, it's um, it's something. But you're doing it for yourself though and that's the, that's what matters. Yeah, yeah. And like I guess sort of in the later years um, I've sort of been more focused on trying to get it out there as, as much as I can. Yeah. Yeah. And so you mentioned some jail sort of stints there or time. So when you do actually get apprehended, the cops take you in, you're always generally uh, non-confrontational. You'll sort of do what they ask to an extent and then what happens, they just sort of, do they scratch their head and say, what the fuck are you doing? Like I'm guessing they don't kind of understand that you're making a statement. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean sometimes they kind of understand Um yeah, it's, it's confusing for them. I, yeah. I, don't, I don't really know yeah. what's going on inside their heads. <laughs> but, you know, they've just got to process me. They've just got to do the job, you know. Like, yeah, I have broken the law as it's written, so they just they just do it. Yeah, and you and you would obviously give them as, as little information as you can. You just do your no-comment stuff. But then they inevitably can use some of that as evidence. And like you said, how, like, how long have you been detained for in, in certain situations? Uh, the longest I was kept on remand for 72 days. Jeez. Um, in Melbourne? Yeah, yeah. I was at the remand centre. Yeah, so my lawyer at the time, it was when I was painting over the billboard on the corner of um, Gertrude. Gertrude and Smith. Yep. And, you know, I'd, I'd painted over. I got sent to jail for a month. So the um, cops caught you red-handed in that scenario? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, somebody in a local, in a, in a shop started calling the cops as soon as I started kind of thing. Yeah. So, yeah, I'd been getting given a month for every time I'd painted over that. So my lawyer's advice was, all right, you've done, you've painted over it again, you've been arrested, maybe don't apply for bail straight away, stay in jail for a month, then we can go back to the magistrate and say, look, he's been in jail for a month, this is how much, you know, he was, how much time he was getting for this previously, you should let him go now because his trial's still, you know, a couple of months down the track. Wow. And... Yeah, they, um, the magistrate wanted me to promise that I wouldn't do it again. And I was like, I'm not promising that. No way. Straight up you just said that to them? Yeah, I knew that they were going to ask that because that's what they always ask. They're like, you know, they want you to be sorry and they want you to promise that you'll be good now. Yeah. But, yeah, I'd already told my lawyer before that, like, I'm not going to do that. So, yeah, uh, the magistrate refused me bail and then we had to apply to the Supreme Court to get me bailed. And um, that ended up being a good decision that's used a lot. Like a lot of legal aid lawyers are like, oh, you were Queen versus McGee, that bail decision. Yeah, we use that all the time. So you're a precedence. Yeah, yeah, because basically the the justice was like, you can't keep somebody for crimes that you think they're going to commit in the future. Like, Yeah, crystal ball es crimes. Yeah, especially when they're low on the scale of criminal offending. So, yeah. you know. so what have they got you for, criminal damage or something like along those lines? Yeah, yeah. 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 So when you go to the Raman Centre in the city for 
criminal damage or painting a billboard, what is the reception like there? Are you, are you interacting with other prisoners? Are they like, what are you doing in here? You painted a fucking billboard now? Yeah, I mean, most people think it's funny and probably think I'm a bit fucking mental. But, um, yeah, like, it's confusing for them as well. Um, yeah, they're like, oh, what do you write? I'm like, no, I don't write anything. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, like... Yeah, you just you're all stuck in there, and you talk shit, and you try to make it the you know least awful time that it can be. Which uh, but you're stuck in there with people that are you know murderers and you know fi- you know a lot of physical assaults, rapists, all that sort of stuff, and you're in there for painting billboards. Is that a moment where you sit there and go, "Am I fucking <laughs> am I this passionate about that sort of thing?" Yeah, yeah, and yeah, the answer was yes. Yes, you know, like. <laughs> No, but the judge is thinking we'll give him some time to reflect on this and he'll learn his lesson. But it Yeah, didn't, no, didn't. they want to intimidate you. They want to it's yeah, it's a violent threat. They're saying if you don't obey our rules, we'll put you in this tank with a bunch of psychos and yeah. that's supposed to put you off. But yeah. It, it, yeah, I and also like I kind of disagree with that about the legal system that for non violent offenders they're put in with violent offenders who often, you know, try to stand over you and, and do all sorts of things and it's not the prison system as everybody knows, is not about rehabilitation. It's just, you know, a punishment tank for people. And, and prison guards like it when there's violence. It's like, you know, it's something to brighten their day, you know. Oh, you see that guy, get that guy. Yeah. And, yeah, obviously everybody's under a lot of pressure and it's a, not the best place, not Did the safest place, but, you know, maybe not as, like, dangerous as Chapel Street on a Saturday night. <laughs> That's it. But do, it doesn't make you a target when you're in there for not physical crimes? Not yeah. Sort of, it does? I think that it does. Like, you know, people just take one look at you and they're sort of like, I know you're not a violent sort of really, really traumatised sort of person. And, yeah. you know, you're not <laughs> – you don't have that look of a violent psycho. So, yeah, people can perceive that as weakness and, and yep. you know, try to – try to use that against you and you can't really do anything about that. No, I guess you're someone who has confidence and you believe in what you believe in. I guess there's probably some white collar crime people that would be in there that would be a a lot uh, more vulnerable than someone like yourself who's, you know, confident about what you do, you know? Yeah, yeah. But, you know, you never know. Somebody could just be in a bad mood one day. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Yeah, look, it's, it's... Jail, like it, uh, it's something that I've never been in that system, but it does intrigue me, and I could imagine. Grab another beer, man. Why not? I might have one too. Um, thank you. Is this another corporate sponsor of yours? No, sadly not. The brewery's around the corner, and they won't give me any beers. Oh, those bastards! I oh, know. It's like right there. <laughs> Cheers. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, you were saying. Um. So I was. Yeah. Well, I was. Just, I find it intriguing because. With the prison system, and obviously, like you said, the whole system is pretty fucked. But uh, with that remand thing, whether you're in for white collar crime or whatever, if you're said you've got to get jail sent jail time, they don't they just send you there and then you get processed. You might go maximum minimum. Everyone's in with the same thing to start with. Yeah, there's an induction unit, and then from there you get sorted. But um, yeah, I got sorted into the naughty unit because I was I had a. I went back to study arts for a bit. I was going to try and do politics and philosophy because the magistrates are like, you're insane, you're, you're this, you're that. I wanted to like sort of study the things that I was talking about so I had a leg to stand on. Yeah. So, yeah, I was basically asking for a governor's request to say, I want to ask to access the internet to be able to continue this online course. And the prison guard was like, you're not going to get that. And I'm like, yeah, I know I'm not going to get it, but I want to like make a governor's request so that then I can talk to my lawyer and maybe like, you know, take things further. He's like, what part of no don't you understand? And I was like, I I heard the word no, but I just sort of disagree with its application to this current situation. Anyway, he just lost it at me and like yelled at me and I just walked back to my cell. And then after that, I got put in the, the regime unit. Regime is when they put you on like in your cell for this time and you got to do that and that. Yeah, it's the punishment unit. Um, but, you know, even that wasn't so bad. No. <laughs> but what do you do to – if you're in the cell all the time, what do you do to pass the time? You're allowed to read books if you're not allowed to access the internet. What are you allowed to fucking do? Uh, yeah, it's hard to get books in. Like you have to like – a visitor on your list, you have to say this visitor is bringing it on this day and this is the title of the book and you have to have all these forms and they make it very difficult. There is libraries in the prisons – and yeah, like when during the day, yeah, you can go outside the cell, you can walk around, you can exercise, you can play sports sometimes, depending on the prison. Yeah. 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 And so that 72 days there, 
you get out. And like you said, the magistrate sort of had concerns for your mental state. Did they give you like a psychiatric evaluation? Do they talk about that, I guess, because you'd repeat offending, for lack of a better term? Yeah, yeah. They definitely wanted to pathologise me. That's um, for sure. But yeah, like they're, they're not really concerned about your mental health. They just like... Tick in a box. Oh, I don't know. They'll just say it to invalidate your protest, you know. like Right. And so you did you do those exams or whatever they've asked? Yeah, I sat through a lot of them. Like particularly when I was younger, they would put me in into those. But re- more recently, I guess as I'm older and, and more confident and more like less clearly fucking depressed, yeah. it hasn't happened as much. <laughs> yeah. So you honestly think that this stuff, your protest has helped your mental state to the point that it's dragged you single-handedly out of depression? Well, I wouldn't say out of depression, but, you know, I'm happier than I was. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) No, depression, look, it's really good that we get to talk about this now and I speak to a lot of people on this show about it because people didn't talk about it years ago. Like, there's different ways to look at it and uh, do you believe that, like, depression is a chemical imbalance or what do you think it is? Yeah, like, for years I was saying... I'm not depressed, the world's fucked, I have an appropriate value system and I know the world, that's why I feel sad about the world, there's nothing wrong with me, like, you guys are full of shit. Um, So, yeah, I sort of had really bad experiences with all psychiatrists and psychologists um, and basically refused to go anywhere near them and, yeah, tried to deal with myself, myself. But, um, yeah, like, drugs definitely help, even when you are knowing what the reason for your distress is. And, yeah, I've certainly been on on them sometimes, you know, just yep. to take that low, lowest low out of it, you know, like if you end up in your room for a week, you know, just wanting it all to be over, like that's not cool. Mm. And if you can take a little pill that stops that from happening and allows you to do what you want to do, then that's a good thing. But, yeah, like mental health is a, a very funny topic because, yeah, the whole world's insane and, you know. Yeah. That, yeah, look, it's true, but at least we can talk about it now. Like, I've got friends that are totally against the medicating of, of really anything, yeah. and I've got other friends that are about it, and, like, you just said that you think that that's it's good, you know, but I've also got friends that self-medicate all the time, smoke weed, and you're like, well, you should take your actual medication. That's been p- prescribed to you, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, well, I get prescribed weed now too, <clears throat> Yeah, so that's pretty cool. Every- that is my medicine. Well, if yeah, if you're if you're that way inclined, I guess no. Well, so I don't I don't smoke weed, and it's not it's just not for me. It's never agreed with me. I just don't really do it. But um, some people it works for, and other people, I guess it's like anything. Man. It's not, yeah, yeah. It like, makes me too fucking paranoid or something. I don't know. Man. Yeah, it definitely can do that. But yeah. you know, that can be a dosing issue as well, can't it? Just yeah. too stoned. But yeah, like for me, it just sort of um, sometimes allows me to enjoy myself, you know, like I can get so heavy in my thought patterns and everything just seems frustrating and annoying. And yeah, I get stoned and have a bit of a giggle and that's yeah. that's a bit of a relief. It takes the edge off. Yeah. So aside from the activism stuff, the painting the billboards, what else do you attribute sort of being happier for? Like did you just remove yourself from certain situations like what else there's got to be some other factors that yeah. personally helped you yeah well yeah i was um when i sort of dropped out of uni and was working all these shit jobs for random losers and paying rent to some negative gearing asshole yeah. like that kind of really gave me the shits and i was kind of resistant to you know being a dull bludger being a squatter but i got to a point where i was just like i'm not doing this anymore so yeah i, I stopped working and i and i started squatting and um, you know that was that was good for my mental health. Yeah, that was like, yeah, much better. So I'm yeah I'm amazed by by the whole squatting thing. It seemed to be a lot I, when I was a kid. You, any abandoned place you'd find squatters. It seems to be a, a bit harder to do now. I'm not venturing into abandoned buildings that much anymore. <laughs> but how does somebody go in there? In I'm guessing you're in your twenties at that stage to find a squat. How did you How did you do that? Oh, there was a bunch of people who did it, and yeah, you would just. Just word of mouth, you'd find people that were doing like-minded sort of shit. Yeah, and, yeah, people would look around for empties and, t- and you know, inform each other of what they'd found and that sort of stuff and, yeah. So it's it a community the, within a com- – within the, yeah. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. But what you do find is that people age out of it. You know, it's all fun and games to be squatting houses in, in your early 20s. But, yeah, when then when people are in their late 30s, they're like, shit, maybe I should, like, stop being such a loser. Yeah. Get a job, start paying rent. Yeah. <laughs> Become part of the system. So yeah. you actually, when I think of squatting, I always think of like 
abandoned office buildings or like industrial area buildings, but people are squatting in actual residential houses. Yeah, yeah. So, so you just find an abandoned one that somebody doesn't give a fuck about, but then the neighbours are going to complain, like all that sort of stuff. Yeah, often the neighbours are happy to have someone in there because, you know, an abandoned house is, you know, the garden's overgrown, it looks terrible. And, yeah, if you can um, talk to them and say, you know, we're not we're not up to anything here, we're just living here, a lot of the time they support it. Yeah. So, they yeah, they feel like at least you're occupying the property and you're not, yeah, as long as they know you're not doing drugs and that sort of thing, I guess then they're sort of happy. Yeah, yeah, even though they're probably doing drugs in their house in as well. Their- <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that was another thing I tried, uh, like, because yeah, I was drinking and what, like, doing whatever drugs young people do. And I was like, you know, maybe this isn't good. So for like, for seven years, I didn't drink or do any drugs. And I was vegan as well. And I was exercising and, you know, trying to, trying to get my mental health on track that way. But that didn't really work. That was just a bit boring, those seven years. Yes, yeah. <laughs> well, like they say, anything in moderation, though. Like, I think when you cut yourself off cold turkey to everything, which is fine. I've had lots of people on this podcast, I'd say 15 people that probably just cold turkey off every drug and alcohol. Yeah. And that's fine for them, but it may not be healthy for other people, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you do what you have to do when you have to do it yeah. kind of thing. But yeah, it's definitely good for some people some of the time. But yeah, Some people just can't handle their stuff. That's they have to go cold turkey, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is, there is that as well. There is that. So when you're squatting, you're meeting other people that have, I'm guessing, similar kind of activism kind of mindsets. And is that is that good from a, a sort of networking perspective? You're surrounding yourself with more like-minded people, or are you finding that that's kind of inhibiting to what you want to want to do? No, it was the first thing, definitely. It's yep. always good to find people who are concerned about the same things you are and, yep. you know, trying to find ways out of the channels that you push through. You know? And these people are actually doing something as well. They're not just sort of talking about it. These, You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, no, there's a lot of people who are just talking about it, saving yep. up their dole checks to go and um, fly to Europe for a, you know, <laughs> radical holiday. <laughs> really? <laughs> Oh well, yeah, like a lot of like with squatting. There's a lot of um, eating out of bins and you know, not spending money, and um, yeah, trying to yeah trying to minimise their uh, the way that their impact on on the globe. I guess is 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 a, is a lot of it. Maybe, but you know, when you spend all your saved up dole checks on plane tickets and <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, that's kind of going against the, against it. So what? How did your family and friends feel about you taking this it's a radical step from going to go to school going to do science and technology was it yeah that uh science and engineering, engineering. yeah yeah they freaked out yeah obviously my parents freaked out a lot of my friends didn't understand and yeah they're just concerned yeah so yeah that was like um yeah something for me to try and prove to these people <laughs> and how do you go about doing that yeah, it's pretty hard. I mean, you can tell somebody what's in your best interests, but they still use their own understanding to sort of, you know, judge you. So, yeah, it can be difficult. Yeah, for sure. And have they eventually come around to understand? Yeah, yeah, definitely. My yeah. parents, like, know that, basically know that there's no talking to me about anything I'm going to do. I'm going to do. No, but they like that. They understand where I'm coming from and, and, and support me in that way. And, yeah, like... Friends as well, yeah. Yeah, and I guess once you start to surround yourselves with other people that have similar ideals, then they're going to be more accepting. The kids you went to school with probably don't fucking get it. But, you know, when you meet other acquaintances squatting or doing other activist stuff, they're going to understand where you're coming from. Yeah, yeah, more likely, yep. Yeah. So with uh, you, you've, your anti-advertising thing is probably your main mantra, I'd say, but you've got other activism stuff. You're, you're obviously against mining as well. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, that was um, I when I escaped Melbourne over COVID. Um, my two daughters live in northern New South Wales, so after the first lockdown, I rode my motorbike up to see them and then Victoria went crazy with COVID and I was like, well, I can't go back there and I can't do the normal normal activism that I do um so from there I went into Queensland and um went to the uh anti Adani um there's a camp you know they bought some land to have people a permanent 
presence there. Yeah, someone's donated that or they, they managed yeah, to. Yeah, basically. Like, so, yeah, the organisation said, hey, if you've got any money, you can lend us. We're going to buy a property to use as a base and then when we're finished, we'll sell it and you'll get your money back. And so that oh, happened yeah. and that was really good for the for the movement. Yeah, so I went up there and, yeah, got involved with Wangan and Jagalingu, the um, traditional owners of that land. They were doing a lot of stuff up there, so that was cool too. And, yeah, basically went into a few coal ports and locked onto those and shut them down for half a day, a day, however long you can. And, yeah, did some actions on the on the first coal trains coming out of the mine. Yep. Yep. And do you feel like you achieved what you set out to do in those those – Activision, active activations. I don't, know <laughs> I don't know what the word is. Activisations. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's all kind of like it gained some media attention, which I guess yeah. is what you're what you were set out to do. You yeah. wanted it to be bigger than just the people on your encampment, sort of thing. Well, yeah, I mean that that mine, the the government always awarding these um these contracts to these companies to to dig this coal, to mine this gas, to do all these things like. Yeah, it's 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 destroying the entire ecosystem. You know, it can't be allowed to continue. Mm. So yeah, there's a part of resistance that's just doing it for the sake of it. But yeah, you want it to have the biggest impact possible. You yeah, know? and you feel like you achieved that with with that there. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the thing, well, I mean, the mine still went ahead. The mine was smaller than it was supposed to be, and there was all sorts of delays, and it cost them a lot. But basically, Adani is just. Um, He's got so much money that he was willing to lose money just to make sure the greenies lost. Yeah. It's um it's yeah. But I mean, it's a complicated situation. Like governments around the world are continuing to prioritize fossil fuels over changing to renewables, which is completely insane. Mm. So yeah, like any resistance to that I think is a good thing. But there has been new legislation that's come in the fossil fuels thing, like it is gonna be phased out. Well, that's what they're saying. Yeah. Do you yeah. see that happening or is that just just choice words from politicians. Yeah, I don't really, I don't, I don't really see it happening. Really, I mean, there's no, well, there's no large scale investment in in renewables occurring, as far as as far as I can see. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, Twiggy, what's his face? The Fortescue Metals dude was on on um, at the National Press Club saying, you know, fossil fuel times over, blah 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 blah. But you know, yeah, like the writing's on the wall. It will end. It has to end. But you know, it should have been twenty years ago. Yeah. And, and now we're gonna we're gonna cop a lot of consequences that we didn't necessarily need to, just because a lot of people want to line their pockets before the end of this fossil fuel stuff. Do you think that Australia is worse than some of the other countries, though? Like, is it a global? Obviously, it's a global issue. Are we that far behind here? Yeah, I think we're pretty bad here. In yeah. a, well, not just in that. In a lot, we're behind some of the world here. Like, if you just look at the the infrastructure we have here, for, you know, internet and stuff like that. We're, we're behind in a lot of different things, you know, and I don't know yeah. whether it's because we're so geographically far away from the rest of the world or we're just fucking behind in general. Yeah, yeah. I think that the uh, government can just get away with a lot here, that um, Australians are pretty apathetic and government just does what they want. And, yeah, like a lot of people are like, oh, fuck the government, they're all dogs, fucking whatever. Yeah, and, you know, that's another type of disengagement that allows all this crap to continue to happen. Um yeah, like, you know, we've got no high-speed rail along the East Coast. That's madness. Yeah, there's all sorts of things that Australia should have done. And, yeah, we've got so much sun and so much sort of, like, capacity to do things differently. But, yeah, when you talk about renewables, you've also got to talk about, you know, how much power do we really need? Because, you know, all of, all of the renewable sources of power also have their own toll. Yeah, well, that's exactly it and is... Like solar obviously is there and like you said, we've got heaps of sun but we don't seem to be harnessing that nearly enough. And then when you look at the way that they say, all right, well, we're going to have a solar rebate scheme, that's all kickbacks and fucking people lining their own pockets in one way or another as well. Yeah, yeah. Disguised as something really positive for the environment. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and like I heard about some huge solar project happening in the north of Australia and it was basically like it's all been done by a Singaporean company that's going to, you know, take the power up by a huge cable back to Singapore. Really? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was Singapore. Oh, yeah, that's fucked, man. <laughs> it's, I don't know. Yeah, look, I can see where the depression sets in when you really think about it. Like, And I think I'm, like, as guilty as most people. I understand that the world's pretty fucked. I stick my head in the sand. I exist in my little bubble. 
Yeah. And then I'm just like, I'm not going to make a difference. So it's commendable that for someone like yourself that just goes, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm actually going to, to speak about it because if enough people are like-minded, then you can make a difference. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But it's like I know that I tried to put my head in the sand as well. You know, I just couldn't. So it's not like I look at somebody who's, you know, got a mortgage and living with their family and working a job and go like, you're a fucking idiot. Like, how could you do that? You're a dickhead. Like, no, no, I get it. Like, yeah. people do what they have to do and do what they can do and, yeah. From a, from my own personal standpoint, like, I used to not give a fuck about what people thought of me and then I had a kid and then that changes it. You know what I mean? And that I think that sort of mentality happens for a lot of people where you're like, I don't care, I'm just going to have fun, do whatever I want. And then you have a kid and you're like, am I – is my actions going to impact them? And that's when I start to feel sort of, you know, and I think that's how a lot of people get stuck. They get have kids, they have a mortgage and they just go, well, I'm stuck in this fucking path forever. Yeah. And they just accept the reality that's handed to them. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, in my case, having kids, um, you know, what's more important for their future? Like um, me having a job so I can like, provide them with some sort of schooling for some future that may not exist or, you know, trying to fight so that there actually may be a world for them to exist in. Yep. <laughs> do they understand that? Yeah, yeah, they do. But, I mean, one of them's only five, so, you know, her That's... grasp of it is uh, not, not the best. No. <laughs> no, no, totally. But your, older, your oldest one... Yeah, yeah, of course they get it. Get but, it. yeah. I mean, yeah, whenever you go outside the system and you you have less money and you have less social esteem, it's like it's a thing. Yeah. And then when you put the fact that you're a, a father on top of that, yeah, the judgment from other people can be greater and your own judgment of yourself can be um, can be a lot more to deal with. But I love the way that you think about it is in you're doing them a disservice if you don't do it, which is a good way to think about it, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, man, I mean, they're fine. They're, they're, you know, kids in Australia. Like, they're, they're going to be okay. They'll like, be they're okay. not, they're not getting blown up in Gaza. They're yeah. not, you know. Yeah, we're in it. we we are in a lucky place here. But uh, the way things are going, if we don't change things too much, we're going to be in a fucking much worse place in the future. I think. Yeah, definitely. So people like <laughs> people like you are doing stuff, so I can just chill out and talk to them. Um, <laughs> No, well, I, I feel you know when you speak to someone like yourself who's so passionate about things like that, it does make me feel guilty. You know what I mean? But I'm not going to be one of those people that's going to tell you I'm going to do stuff because I'm not actually probably going to do it. Yeah. So that's probably worse when people say, "Good on you no, for doing it." Like, you know, yeah, that's good. Like yeah. honesty, like that's all you need, really. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Um. So let's talk about one of your biggest. Activisions, activations, I still don't know what to say. Uh, was it actions. Actions, maybe. actions. Was it Flinders Street Station? Do you want to break that one down for us a little bit? Yeah. Can you say? Can you talk about it or not really? Yeah, no, I can. Like, I don't know whether my lawyers would say that I should, but I will. Yeah. Um, yeah, I went in there with the fire extinguisher on Black Friday and, yeah, I'd, I'd been to Europe and met an, a bunch of other anti-advertising activists from around the world and, yeah, so this Belgium group, a group based in Belgium was organising this um, Zap Games, they called it, which is like... On this, Black Friday because it's a consumerist day? Yeah, in the week leading up to Black Friday. Yeah. So, yeah, they had all these different categories and, you know, basically encouraging people to, to mess with advertising during this week. So, yeah, that was happening. It was also like the, the Victorian election was the next day. Um, yeah, so I just sprayed over the big video screen that's right through the gates of Flinders Street Station. And, um, yeah, uh, so, yeah, did that. None of the train staff wanted to talk to me, so I just left. The police eventually caught up with me. And, yeah, they're saying that um, the, the screen had no protection. The paint went straight through it and um, destroyed it. It's and like an LED screen or something. Yeah, I don't even know what the tech was, but, yeah, it, it sort of went all, like, green, pixely around the outside of the paint and then it just didn't work. And Excuse me. Yeah, it was out of action for like five or six months. And which which you've achieved something that you've really set out to do in that capacity then. Yeah, yeah. But the thing is the with the criminal damage charge, they must, you know, prove that I had an intention to damage it. Right. And basically I didn't because I thought that it would be protected. I yep. thought that this would be a cleaning job. If I was going to do something publicly like that, I, I'm not going to be causing that amount of damage because I know what's going to happen, that they're going to have 
the the reason to send me to jail for a long time, which is you know not what I want. No. So yeah, that's going to trial on the twenty seventh of May in the county court because any damage above a hundred thousand dollars has to be heard in the county court. So they're saying that it's more than a hundred grand. Yeah. Well, the replacement screen that they've quoted is yeah two hundred and fifty thousand or something. But you know, this one has an epoxy resin coating to you know protect it. Yeah. yeah. Like I'm basically just going to say, I fully thought this was going to be a protected screen. It was going to be a cleaning job. You know, it's a practical and symbolic protest. You know, I want it to be striking enough to actually engage people. But I don't want to just because I'm doing it openly. I'm not just going to yeah. like cause hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of damage because then what's going to happen? Yeah. So that. Leads me to another thing. You, you, you obviously don't – you could have bolted if you wanted to and you just calmly walked away. Is that part of the protest or is that just because you don't want them chasing after you, you know, like you want to just do what you do and, and, and face the consequences that might be there? Like it's – yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Like it's kind of like I'm not ashamed – by what I'm doing and I want people to know and I want to defend it. I want to be like, yes, I'm a person, this is my name, this is what I did, this is why I did it. And, um, you know, like obviously a lot of people think that the the secretive, covert way is the way to go. Um, but I guess I'm trying to be the public-facing, you know, yeah. variety of protest that it's just like, no, I'm open about this. And, you know, that's just what sits best with me. Yeah. I understand other people do things in different ways and don't judge them for that. But, yeah, yeah. this is what makes more sense to me because I think that, um, yeah, we, we sort of really need to start talking about it. Like the, the aim of my whole activism and life basically is to convince people that, you know, if you believe in democracy, if you believe – in any of this stuff that's been, you know, fought for for centuries, then we have to get rid of this toxic media. Like, it's it's so clearly fucked. And like, I'm sort of scratching my head. I feel like I'm taking crazy pills because there's all these, like, you know, leftist intellectuals that are talking about democracy and how it's not working. I'm like, have you not noticed the fucking corporate media? Is that not clearly the biggest fucking problem that we should be dealing with? Mm. But, you know, like so many of these people, they write and work for these organisations and they, they sort of, like... um they have their sections where like a little bit more lefty thought is allowable. Yeah, it's all just this sort of locked in mess. So now that you, for that case in particular, you're going to trial for that, can they bring up prior stuff for that sort of thing? Or we'll they... be bringing up prior stuff because I'll basically be showing that this is an ongoing protest and I have always tried to minimise the physical damage that I cause for obvious reasons not liking jail, being chiefly among them. But, yeah, so it'll they they can bring it up. I don't, I don't know if they can bring it up, the yeah. prosecution, but, you know, will we bring it up? And then, so what are you looking at potentially having to, can they, do they make you pay some of that money back or they look at, at, at per, per, to make you do prison time or what does, what even, you don't know? I have no idea, but, yeah, I just don't worry about it. Yeah, I'll, I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. But yeah, like I don't have any money. I'm never going to have any money. They can't, you know, find me. What? What are you going to do? Yeah, that uh, finding thing is quite interesting because, like, I don't know exactly how it works. I've got some friends that are like they can't really get you for fines. There's a statute of limitations after seven years or ten years. Do you know anything about that sort of stuff? Um, well, I just know my experience, which is that I've never paid court fines, um, whether it's been court costs or like. Um, Sometimes the court orders you to pay restitution to the victim and I, I've never paid any of them. And, yeah, there's been times when I've, I rep represent myself a lot and, you know, I'm open about the fact that I don't pay fines to the magistrates yep. and they know that I don't pay fines and then they'll give me a fine because, you know, they don't want to send me to jail because I guess they can see that it's kind of pointless and this is all just a joke. Yeah. I mean, it, all, it is a laughable situation. Really, like you're going up to these people and they're supposed to be the representatives of justice and democracy and you're like, this whole system's a fucking joke and you know it. And yeah. they do know it. They have to know it. They're either like complete idiots or they know it. <laughs> but is this because the, the system's been around for so long and it's just outdated or is it just because it's run to... Yeah, like what, what, do, you, what do you think? How do you overhaul that kind of criminal justice system? Yeah, well, I'd say that the criminal justice system is not really the problem. It's the It's the dominance of the parliamentary 
system by the corporates. And yeah, I feel like with the huge wave of pushing for democracy, um, that capitalism basically decided we have to, what we will do is we'll just let them have it. But if, if we have the media, we can control it and we can keep it going our way. It'll it'll be great. We'll trick them into thinking that they have some sort of power. Well, you know, they can vote every now and again, and we'll just keep doing what we do. And that's exactly what's happening. And yeah, obviously, I think it's the media that enables this. Remember, what do you say to people that would say, why don't you go and fuck the system up from inside? Why don't you go and be a part of that and change it from within? Well, it's a bit late for that. <laughs> but, yeah, like, yeah, people can try to do that, but I think they usually end up being corrupted, you know. Like, if you have to change yourself to get in, at what point do you take off the cloak and go, oh, this is the real me? Like, when do you have enough power to do the mm. thing? Like, when you're Rupert Murdoch? Like, and if you are, if you do get to that position, you've changed getting there. Yeah. yeah, I guess Peter Garrett's someone who kind of looks a little bit like that. Like he went in with these ideals and then came out the other end totally different. Yeah, yeah, that was a real shame job. Yeah, you, yeah I, I don't, I don't. To be honest, I don't follow politics. Like I understand it a little bit, but uh, yeah, from seeing that sort of unfold from my little political views, it's it's pretty fucking pretty un like it's not how I thought it would have gone down or not how he would have probably intended it to. Yeah, yeah. Well I guess he started making compromises from like I don't remember either really and I'm like you, like I don't actually pay that much attention to politics and, and because I'm talking about media, people expect me to be this expert on the media landscape. Like I don't fucking read it. I don't like it. It's all fucking shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> but I, yeah, what Peter Garrett did, like he could have been he could have run with the Greens, but he decided, no, I'm gonna go with Labour because they'll actually have power and I can do something with power. But you know, that was the first compromise and the compromise is stacked up until he was a complete joke. Yeah. It's and then he's back singing again. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so like, man, it, there's so many questions that I want to, <laughs> well, like what, what do you, okay. So you're allowed to sort of have your utopian world where, with, where media isn't in your face. Does, does the society function like we do function in Australia now without media and without them controlling like the, the, the whole democratic fucking landscape is that your perfect view or do you have another kind of perfect view i'm basically saying we need to replace the corporate media with the democratic media system which basically has to be publicly funded and the thing that i sort of say around that is that you know you have these institutions of democracy you've got the parliament itself you've got the public service you've got the judiciary the media is just as important as these other elements you know it's the thing that tells everybody all the citizens what's going on it's also got a huge educational um purpose and you know a function in aiding critical thought which is you know a necessity for democracy for people to be able to think through things on their own but yeah um so yeah what i would say is probably like you'd have maybe some number some number of competitive um organizations government funded with a democratic mandate that are sort of like basically trying to provide the best service for the money that they get. And yeah, like of course there'll be all kinds of problems with it and it'll be really difficult to work out and yeah, but you know, it's going to be it's going to be better than the capitalist media, I'd say. Totally. What's your view and this is something a little bit distant from what you sort of normally talk about because I know that your major issue is with advertising that is to do with organizations for profit right yeah yeah how do you feel about not-for-profit organizations advertising that sort of thing yeah well, i feel like the not-for-profits have got sucked into the whole advertising game by by the for-profits and yeah obviously ngos kind of yeah there's a there's a lot of problems with those like they're, they're a symptom of a, a system that's failing and we're saying oh we're here to plug the gaps and asking for donations from people who actually have a soul to fund these things and then once they get funded pretty much all they want is to make sure the funding keeps happening and everyone keeps having jobs mm. yeah uh yeah i'm not really a big fan of ngos in, in that way especially when they spend so much of the money that's donated to them in advertising to get more donations yeah it's it's like robbing peter to pay paul it's like this vicious cycle of of money and people like you said kind people that donate to these things they think that that money's going to help people 
and it's going like they're paying CEOs, they're paying rent, they're paying advertising. What percentage of those dollars is actually getting to people? It's pretty fucking yeah, small. Yeah, it's small. And I mean, there is organisations that will tell you which organisations are best in terms of like the money actually getting where it's supposed to go. But yeah, it's like that they're a symptom of a broken system, and totally. they're, they're they're not good. <laughs> There's I, I've had some dealings with that in the past. I'll tell you about it afterwards. Where how much money actually got filtered down to some people that needed and. Uh, yeah, it's definitely not what they uh, what they make out to be at a lot of the time. Yeah, that, that's a, that's another problem we're going to fix while we're here fixing the problems. <laughs> I'll add it to the yeah, list. I we'll need a few more beers. For <laughs> <that>. <laughs> we'll need a few more beers. Um, so, without with, if, with without thinking about what your lawyer would tell you to do, would you will you stop doing this? Is this a lifelong fucking pursuit for you? Yeah, I would say so. Like, unless things change dramatically, which will be, you know, some kind of, you know, disaster. I don't, I don't know exactly what it would be, but yeah. yeah, like as long as as long as um, democratic, ostensibly democratic governments are holding together, I'll always be saying this can't work with a capitalist controlled media. Definitely. Yeah, and so then you've got no intentions of stopping, but you might change the way that you are doing this activist stuff yeah i mean i've sort of always been changing i started using a roller over big it was plastic skins back in those days they don't really use them so much anymore it's all going digital but yeah i started painting over large ones but then that quantum of damage was used as a as a reason to put me in jail so i sort of scaled down started painting over glass panels in bus stops just i i made it less and less damage until the point that i was putting posters over over tram stops and going out every week with a film crew and, you know, having engagements with people. And, yeah, like that was an interesting thing, an interesting way for it to go. But it turned out that that level of interference was the police would just try to ignore it. And um, it sort of wasn't annoying enough, basically. So yeah. I have to scale it up a little bit but not scale it up so much that Jail I'm in danger of, yeah. yeah. When you're doing those paste up sort of things, are the general public, do they get it? Do they... Are they curious, you know, or is yeah. it a spectrum of, yeah? Yeah, like a lot of them love it and, yeah, a lot of them hate it. The people who hate it, they don't really make much sense. They're just sort of like fascist people. Yeah, they're just like, yeah, you're the, defacing this. There's rules. I'm angry. Yeah. I'm angry for this. Yeah. <laughs> I can't be angry. Yeah. But that's the other thing that you've got to think of about if there was going to be an overhaul, there are some really big businesses that they, this is their form of, that's that's their bread and butter, and to to get rid of that for them, they're gonna fucking go kicking and screaming, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's taking on world capitalism, and that that's their power. Mm. So you know, what will they do? They'll do what they do. They'll fucking kill everyone. Yeah, <laughs> but see now with people are going out less. Obviously, people are consumed with their phones, and now advertising is infiltrating into right there. And like, I've got a son. And he's on his iPad, and he's the, the ads there. They're indoctrinating him to being consumers from an early age. Yeah, you know yeah. that's a whole different fucking thing to the outdoor advertising world. Yeah, things have definitely changed since I started doing this. Yeah, and social media now, everybody's like becoming their own billboard for a whole bunch of stuff, and that's how people are making a living. And it's like, yeah, I remember seeing some documentary like kids these days don't even know what selling out is. They, they think that it's a positive thing. Like if, if you can sell out, that means that somebody's interested in you and you're a success. Yes, yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, they don't really understand that you, that could be great as a short-term gain for monetary purposes, but it's bad for your long-term, like for your, for your own. Yeah, and I don't think you could – as a kid, you don't understand that. Well, I'll take the money, take the money. But when, you, when you're older, you realise you don't want to compromise your artistic view because of money. Yeah. That's something the kids probably can't understand early. No, no. But I mean, yeah, like when you think about 90s anti-globalisation and all the sort of teenagers there going to the anti-WTO rallies, there was this kind of sense of, you know, like international corporations are bad and, you know, selling out is bad and, you know, all this punk music talking about not that. Yeah. But, yeah, it's sort of that time has passed. That And not to name any names, but I know people that were going to those protests and now they have corporate jobs, you know? So in time, the system got them, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's the same. Like, since the 60s, you know, they were all saying, no, nah, we're going to take acid and have sex and never grow up. But, you know, 
they, they all bought houses a, you know a few years down the track Correct. and yeah it's, it's it's a common thing for people to be very yeah that's stupid saying you know like if you're not a revolutionary by 20 you've got no heart if you're not a conservative by 30 you've got no brains which is you know disgusting but it does play out it's yeah i think and that's probably a natural like as a kid you think i'm always going to be rebellious but as a bit old you maturity comes into it as well but i think the older you get the less people want to take risks, the less people want to go against the system and they want to just fucking slide into normality, you know? Yeah, it's tiring being outside the system. <laughs> yeah, it would be. <laughs> but that, that's another thing, like within this whole system that we talk about, from birth they give you the birth certificate which then puts you in the system and then once you're in you can't really get out of it. And it's in a, we're in a scary time now where this is all going to be digital. Like we're old enough that we got given a birth certificate you know, and if we choose to lose that, you choose to lose it. You know, you don't need to have that. But kids soon are going to have all this digital shit that they'll have to. They'll be in the system whether they want to go against it or not. You know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess when I said outside, I wasn't saying like not a part of it at all. You know, I'm definitely a part of it. They can grab me and put me in their prison cells, can't they? So yeah, and you're always a part of the the community. Whatever you're saying about the future of it, like. Mm. Yeah, and that's kind of like when, when when people are saying, oh, yeah, government's fucked and we need to, like, trash it all and start again. Like, you're always going to wind up with a community. Have there's to. always going to be a way that you're going to have to relate. Even if there's 20 people in a new little fucking commune, there's going to be someone who leads and – you know what I mean? Like, that's yeah. always going to be the case. Yeah. So what do you suggest for younger people that are watching this that do want to make a difference or do want to not just bury their head in the sand? What would you suggest that they do – just, that's that's a lot of pressure. Well, like, no, yeah. no, no, no. I'm not saying that they're going to do it. I'm just saying if you, if you were a kid now and you don't want to just be part of the system and you're thinking about let's not bury our head in the sand, let's try and change things, what would you sort of say that they should be doing? Oh, I don't even know what I'm supposed to do. But, yeah, it's, it's, it's very difficult. And obviously, like, I'm doing what I'm doing and that's, like, got its own problems and its own, like, ineffectual nature. Like, I don't know what to do. Like, the problems are huge and, yeah, all of the power of the world is arrayed against you. Like, the the question of what to do is really personal. But um, yeah, if you if you feel you need to do something, then do it. Like, there's yeah, I guess it's sort of like it is self interested. Like, what I've been doing is self interested. Like, if there's a a certain part of yourself that you have to honour, or like a certain way that you have to go. So it's yeah, it's a very personal thing, and like I yeah. couldn't really give general advice to kids no. about, without knowing them or but, anything that they care about. But you would say that just go against the grain, and if you fo- if you feel like that something's not right, speak up about it and sort of try in any way you can to make change. Is that kind of like the mentality? I would definitely say that. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, like you like you say, like everybody's aware of the problems, but everybody's aware of how difficult they are to change, and so that is everybody stops. Nobody does anything. And that was one thing that got me when I was young. I was like, well, if we didn't stop, if we all just did shit, then things would change. Yeah. But yeah, like taking that leap then you've, you've ruined your own life. Yeah. Um, nobody's with you. And um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. But, yeah, like some people just have to do that. And if you're one of those people, then honour yourself and yeah. do that. Yeah. It's like sometimes with the stress of the world, you think it is, it's a lot easier just to think I'm going to ignore this, I'm going to just exist. And I think that's why a lot of people just watch shitty TV shows, do their job, because if you do think about the scary world out there, it is too, it's just too much. And that's yeah. the problem, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The whole, yeah, don't take the weight of the world on your shoulders. But, yeah, it's like if, if more people were taking the weight of the world on their shoulders, then it wouldn't be such a disastrous thing for the people who do decide to delve into it. Yeah. But, yeah, like I'm, I'm escapist too. Like I'm always watching stupid television shows or doing whatever I can to feel okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it's a very, very strange and difficult time, you know. Yeah, but I guess in those sort of situations when you do want to consume media, whether it's social media, whether it's, like you said, watching TV shows or whatever, you've signed up for the advertising and that can you, – like you you are getting this product so that ad- advertising can be in your face and you think that that's just part and parcel of it. It's different to when it's shoved down your throat in public? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm basically saying like social media as it exists like wouldn't exist. Like you – 
basically you, the only time you should see advertising is when you seek it out and not like it shouldn't be jammed between other content that is interesting to you. Yeah. Like you should only be seeing it if you only want to see that. Like because, yeah, advertising is often squeezed into content that's offered as a bribe, you know, like, yeah. oh, you like seeing that, do you? Well, here's, here's a few ads. Yeah, I'm saying it should be just completely isolated. So say, and this is because we linked up through Instagram, social media platform, Yeah, you feel that that should be like a paid service because someone's got to pay for it at some stage. So people choose the free option all the time with stuff so they become the product. Yeah. So what do you think with something like that business? Like Instagram is not going to go away tomorrow and they're not going to reevaluate their business model. So you think people should pay 50 bucks a year or something yeah. and then have it advertising free? No, I don't think people should pay. I think it should be nationalised. <laughs> right. Okay. Know, it should be. It should be a public service. service. Our, our our social media platform should be controlled and and run on democratic principles as well. Wow. Not be okay. soaked in advertising and because you know you see all the all the things that Meta does to try and suppress certain content and lift up others. You know they want everyone to be shallow. They want everyone to be materially obsessed. You know like what they do with the Palestine content. You know they they try to squeeze it all out. They try to push it all out. Mm-hmm. They try to push. People yeah. down, yeah, and they're, yeah, they're they're running an agenda. They're going, we want you to be fucking idiots who don't know anything and don't care about anything and just want to buy shit, and yeah. you know, they're pretty good at it. And but they've got Meta, you know, Instagram, Facebook, that whole umbrella company has got a, a besides TikTok, it's got a stranglehold on the whole sort of social media thing. So you think that 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 should there should be one social media platform per country that is democratic that then is a service? Like, I don't know. Great question. Yeah, these these are things that should be discussed by people who know more than me probably. <laughs> but, yeah, like, I mean, obviously all of those businesses are international and, yeah, there should probably be an international response, you know. But Let's, then you get yourself into dangerous territory like in China where they have that communist thing and then they don't let them use certain parts of the internet. So then you go, you go down the path of potentially having internet that's regulated by the Commonwealth or something, you know? Yeah, yeah. But you know, So like, that's a, where does that, yeah. Who do you trust? Do you trust the corporates or the state more? And obviously if you've got a state that's repressive and a problem. But yeah, the way that I would say that it should be written into the, into the contract, into the mandate of the company is basically like the government is separate, shouldn't control... And you know we have to we have to live up to these libertarian, democratic principles in in everything that we do. Yeah, and I think just from a from a global standpoint, looking at Meta going head to head with TikTok now, like the US definitely wants to wants to not they don't want that sort of Chinese technology infiltrating all their social media. Yeah, it's yeah. going to be an interesting space that whole social media thing in the next few years. Yeah, yeah, and all this like sort of statecraft shit that these elites are talking about like it's ancient crap like we're, we're not here to fight we're not here to battle for supremacy we just have to chill out on the fucking rock and stop killing each other yeah. and yeah, it's very difficult to get rid of that whole like competitive state shit from these dinosaurs who are just ugh. but it's got to go you know the, the americans f- f- always have something that they're trying to compete with someone else with, whether it's, you know, the Cold War, whether they always have to try and swing their dick bigger than someone else. You know what I mean? It's true. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, uh, it's And now a, it's a social media race. Yeah. Well, that's just one form of power that they're grappling over. But yeah. yeah. Man, you're an interesting dude and I could talk to you for hours. But yeah, we probably should cut it off. <laughs> we, we shouldn't. <laughs> Is there anything else you want to talk about? Nah, not particularly. I mean, I can't even really remember what I've said. But... On that note then, Kyle McGee, activist, activator, activizer. <laughs> Thanks for coming, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for the beers that you didn't get paid for. <laughs> <laughs> they definitely didn't. <laughs> Cheers, man. 3,000. 3,000.